we're very happy once again to talk with the uh, highly esteemed CEO of the Mortgage Lab, uh, Rupert Goff. It feels like I should say Rupert Goff Esquire, you know, Rupert, because we love... <laughs> we love like, Rupert Goff the third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we love seeing your, your columns on, on, on One Roof, uh, you're on the TV, you're, you're everywhere. I don't think you're overexposed, but you're everywhere, so it's a big honour well, for us to have you today. Someone did describe me as oversaturated, actually, recently, but... Uh... <laughs> Fear not, you're only oversaturated in the shower. So um, <laughs> the things we wanted to chat to you about today, get the unique perspective, because you and your team across the country are dealing with all the time to break or not to break, especially, I guess, in terms of what's going to happen with interest rates. That's point one. And the second is borrowing for other investments, so shares, crypto, NFTs, what's the bank's feel? What's, I guess, your view from what you're seeing on the coalface? So can you share some insights with those two things? Yeah, first? well, let's let's talk about breaking first because I think that's really topical to right now. So in the past six months, we've seen uh, interest rates go from 2.09 to 3.65. Uh, so um, that, that I'm talking the one-year fixed rate there. Uh, so big jump. And what people are thinking is, well, look, if I, if I break now, uh, then – you know, I could, if it keeps going up, I'm going to lock in this albeit terrible rate compared to what it was, but is it going to be even worse in the future? Mm. So there are a couple of things that you have to think about, and it's it's a little tricky to do um, by a video or, or podcast or however you listen to this, mm. but um, uh, essentially what you want to think about is how long until that that refix occurs. So if you just left your account to sit there, your refix would be due in, say, six months' time. Okay, so that's six months. What premium am I going to be paying in the meantime? So you locked at 2.09, and you've got six more months left to go on that. If you break today, you would be paying 1.5% more. So that's your premium for six months. So 1.5% premium times half a year, you're basically paying 0.75% of your mortgage additional um, for the bet that today's date, today's interest rate rather, is better than six months. So based on that, the amount of time left and the premium you're going to pay in the meantime, do you think the rates are going to move by 0.75% because that's what we figured out the premium you're going to pay in the next six months. And and if you do, if your view is that in six months' time it's going to be another percent higher, uh, then you would you would break that. Speaking purely from a financial perspective. Okay. Um, so just you, just because now my head's spinning. That's and, right. Yeah. And we've only been talking for three minutes. <laughs> Is, all right, so just Everyone's to gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was nice having you all. For just to yeah. recap that, so but actually some of that did actually click. So in other words, you're at a rate of two ish, and you're steering down the barrel of three and a half plus. Right, that's the this is the movement, and so uh, if you figure out okay, just to recap your break now, but you've still got six months to go on this wonderful low rate. Right, so you're kind of trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to have to pay that much more, but for now I'm being penalised effectively because for six months I'm on this higher rate. Is it worth it looking at maybe then that will end up being a lower rate in a couple of years to come? Is that, mm. That's what you said, right? Well, it's, you can't really forecast beyond the next refix because um, for starters, anyone that says they can is just outright lying because so many things are affecting the economy at the moment. It's really about is the next refix that you've got due going to be, you know, if you, if you do it now, is it going to be cheaper than in the future? Um, uh, so, and, and are you willing to pay a premium in the meantime? It, almost everyone who breaks a rate today will be paying more than they fixed it last year because they were awesome last year. Hmm. Um, so are you willing to pay that extra amount and, you know, in the meantime just to lock in what – could be a good rate in hindsight in six months' time. It's mm. yeah, and look, and this is what's so frustrating is that that people, you know, they, they email us and message us and say, should we break now? 
there is so much in that that formula. You have to have a pretty solid view of where the rates are going um, in the next however long until you refix. You have to um, understand the premium that you're paying um, in the meantime. Because so to go back to our example, the example I use, you were paying 0.75 percent premium, but you were you you had the view that you know in six months' time the rate is going to be a percent higher. So you've saved 0.25 percent by breaking now. But to me, look, I mean. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say privileged, um, but to, to me that that risk of just 0.25 on a on a bet just doesn't seem worth it. Mm. Uh, you would have to have you'd have to see a wild swing, in my opinion, because you don't want to just break even. You, mm. you don't want to break now, pay the premium just to just for it to move 0.75 percent uh, in the meantime. So I think you have to be looking at quite a substantial savings. Um, so for instance. If you were um, if you were paying a percent and a half uh, more, but your rate was in three months' time, um, so you're, you're paying a quarter of it, so um, call, it, call it 0.35 for these numbers, 0.35 percent. But you thought in three months' time the interest rate was going to be one and a half percent, or one percent, or one and a half percent higher. That would be worth right to pay that. Small 0.35% premium for a few months to lock in today's rates at 3.65 or 3.6 rather than pay 4.6 or 5.1. Um, so that, to take it to the extreme, that, mm. that's how it worked. So as an example, maybe there's two examples we could talk about. The other day somebody was talking to us and we said, look, it's not really our thing, but they said, look, we can get 2.99 with a certain bank, but the rate runs out today. Uh, and they were already on 2.99. Six five, and it was, it was not a huge break. It might have been, I don't know, like a month or something like that. And we said, well, perhaps that sounds pretty good. And it was some crazy thing. It was like two point nine nine for two or three years. Now uh, we're no mortgage advisors, but we pay a mortgage. So I said, take it. <laughs> that yeah. sounds pretty good. But of course, uh, double check with. Uh, uh, I can't I'll remember if using the mortgage lab anyway. <laughs> but, we said, but double check with your mortgage <laughs> advisor. Like so, some things are super obvious. That's sort of what you're saying. Like it's, it's it, it, if it's going to be super obvious, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and walks like a duck, then breaking could be worth it. But in other things, you're trying to sort of really read the tea leaves, aren't you? And and yeah. and so where yeah. is it going to go? And of course, there's that has no factual basis whatsoever. So no, yeah. No. No. So, oh, so that's a great example. So let's have a look at that that one. So let's say they um, they owed a hundred thousand dollars on their mortgage. Wouldn't that be nice? A mm. uh, hundred thousand dollars on their mortgage. They're currently at two point six cents. So they pay two thousand six hundred dollars a year in interest. Yep. They can break. There's not going to be any break fees because we're in an up uh, increase in interest rates. So forget about break fees. But they could lock in at two point nine nine. Now, now, if they um, uh, if they come back in six months' time, that two year rate is going to be mid fours. It's, it's already low fours, um, so it's going to be mid to low, low to mid fours. So they are saving themselves one and a half percent essentially. Um, their view is that in six months' time, the two year rate is going to be one and a half percent higher. They're paying 03 percent for half a year. That, that's great. That's, they're going to pay essentially. $150 more interest than they would have to lock in a below 3% rate um, now. I think, um, th yeah, and so so mm. it's a no-brainer, right, because we've taken that kind of to the extreme. So I, mm. I it's it's really good to nut out these these ideas because you have to have a view of what the rate's going to be in the future and how much premium you're going to pay in the meantime. Mm. Here's right. another sort of example then. What if we had a customer that, say, had, say, I don't know, like half a million dollars they're on, I don't know, a rate from last year, which might be 2.5%, 2 2.3%, 2 maybe something like that. They're coming up for a break soon, uh, I guess, and they'd be looking at a one-year rate or a two-year rate or a three-year rate. So what sort of things, when they're talking with their mortgage advisor, what sort of things should the lender be asking, the person be asking, rather? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the decision between the one year and, say, the three or five year is, is fundamentally a cash flow versus risk thing. So you, you pay a lot more in interest, well, comparatively a lot more in interest to lock in for five years. Mm. Uh, so you're, you're paying more on your mortgage money is going out the door um, a lot faster, mm. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, however, the next five years, you know what you're paying. Uh, now, if we take it back a year, um, you know, you could get 2.1% uh, for one year or 2.99% for five years um, on the on the real specials. It, it sort of stuck around the 3.5, but you could get as low as 2.99%. Mm. I think, uh, so So you were paying a lot more, but I think no one's going to... Sorry, it sounds like someone's ringing uh, through to ask about their to... rates at this very moment. Yeah. Just going out live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Anyway, we'll get back to them later. <laughs> that, caller, that caller wasn't ready to... <laughs> <laughs> they weren't ready to lock in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So um, uh, I think anyone who locked in for five years um, last year probably is, isn't regressing anything, right? So um, that yet they've paid that premium. But it could have easily stuck around the low twos for the next four years and they would have been paying too high premium. So the, the, the thing is, if you want low risk but are willing to sacrifice some expense for that, you take the longer term. Mm. Uh, if, you, if you want short term, cheaper, but you've got a risk that in a year you're going to jump from 2.1 to 3.65. Um, that is the risk you take. Mm -hmm. My preference, and this is not everybody's preference, my preference is you take short um, terms and you pay off your mortgage because mm -hmm. you, if you use that money, to, the extra money you would have paid on interest to pay off your mortgage, then your debt's gone. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what happens in five years, you know, it's going off. That's my preference, but it's not it's not for everyone. So that's why we have a discussion around it. So in other words, if you've got the money uh, available, then you might say, okay, had I taken this higher rate, which is a, a three-year rate or a five-year rate, I would be paying X. Could I instead pay that off my mortgage as extra payments? Because some banks right, will let you pay off extra without penalty in each uh, calendar year, right? Yeah, um, uh, it tends to be measured from when you... Uh, fix the rate is, is from that year to year. Mm. Um, but yes, they, they'll allow you uh, most, I think now most will pay, allow you to pay up to 5% of your mortgage off without any penalty. Now, a couple of them like you to do that in one lump sum, mm. and a couple of them like you to do it uh, by increasing payments so that you, you pay 5% of your mortgage off. But that, that's quite a substantial amount over a year. That's, yeah. You're saving a lot of money. So that's probably, perhaps, if you're thinking, how did I save money, but uh, what's the market going to do? I don't know. You know. I don't want to gamble with it with the future, which is unknown. That, perhaps, is a practical compromise. Yeah, I mean, the biggest way to win against interest rates is just not have a mortgage, right, is to, is to pay down your mortgage quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, talk to your accountant about which one, which which stuff to pay off first. Um, although, it's probably less and less... Um, Tax yeah. deductibility is less and less important, but yeah. We still think it's good to pay off your non-deductible debt first and then leave your uh, investment debt later, because uh, yeah. at least you can still claim some of that, depending on your circumstances. But and and Who knows really if those good. rules will change back, right? Yeah, and who knows what will happen there. Um, okay, so that's good, really practical advice. What you've really stepped us through, Rupert, is I guess this approach, this approach, or a middle ground. and. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's not always numbers. It's about where your your how comfortable you feel with risk as well, and yep. cash flow as you mentioned. Yeah, the, and I yep. like that suggestion because I guess even like an extra fifty bucks a week or something, if the budget allows for that, it, it's all going to help in driving down that that mortgage, isn't it? Mm. So uh, let me use me as an example, for instance. So I would pay. I'm a, I'm a mortgage broker, but I would pay. Uh, minimum amount on my mortgage uh, on the cheapest rate um, is because my income fluctuates because I'm self-employed. Now, at the end of the year, I will make a lump sum payment onto my mortgage once I'm comfortable. I know how much is retained in my business, but I kind of need that money in the business for, for fluctuations. Mm. So, uh, but but someone who was on a higher salary, uh, salary who's on a you know, good income, may choose just to pay 
either more, you know, cheaper rate, more off the mortgage, or flex in for a longer term, and that would come down to their risk tolerance. But you can see how it, you cannot just talk to your neighbour mm. and find out what they're doing and just do the same. It doesn't, it doesn't work because it's very much horses for horses. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. No, I'll ring the neighbour back later. Yeah, tell them, tell them you're not doing it. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm not taking that advice. <laughs> okay, well, that's really practical. Thank you. And I think in some ways I feel it actually takes a bit of the pressure off because there's, you know, there's always somebody who's saying, oh, I got a great rate, you know, but the implication is you didn't. <laughs> What's yeah. wrong with you, yeah. you know? And But it's actually, it's, it is not so cut and dried. And even one could argue it's not this is right and this is wrong. It's, mm. a, it's more value judgments and each person's circumstances and mortgage and everything, they're all going to be different, aren't they? Yeah, I think the only wrong decision is if someone says, why did you do that? If you can't say, because of this, then, then that it hasn't been thought through at the moment. So, mm. yep. yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, well, um, the second thing we said we wanted to chat about is borrowing to buy stuff that isn't a fixed asset. Yeah, like like property, e.g., shares, crypto, NFTs. I guess we're interested to know what appetite do the banks have for that. But even just, I guess, initially observations re these kind of uh, investments. There, do you have sort of any general comments initially? Yeah, I mean, look, um, as a as a caveat, I I am not a bull on on uh, cryptocurrency. Um, you know. I've said it before, but but um, I feel like crypto is a great idea and, and has its um, place, but it feels a little bit like the Motorola and Nokia of the cell phone industry in that it's the first the first um, iteration of it, and there's a few bugs in the system, and it's not quite a touch screen yet. Um, and and I, I'm waiting to see an iPhone come out, and you know, an iPhone equivalent come out that shakes the cryptocurrency. Um, world. Um, now, I'll, just, I'll uh, just jump in and say for those of you who don't know what Motorola and Nokia is, and you'll have to, you'll have to Google that. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. you know, born after a certain year, will be like, what? Yeah. What is a Motorola? Yeah. yeah. You, you know, let's just throw the, out the, um, the, the first versus version the of cell phones, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this, this is the big brick that you hold to your ear, uh, Motorola. Mm. Um, Back yeah, when the and... Earth's crust was still cooling. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, so so this the, dinos the dinosaurs used yeah. to walk around with these big cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this is a good analogy because, yeah, obviously, you know, Bitcoin had come out as in great, okay, it's going to be the currency of the future, but the transaction fees, uh, et cetera, have kind of been what's, what's killed it. So it's become more an investment to, to make on the gain. Uh, and then Ethereum, likewise, has got sort of high gas fees on it, so that, and there's some minimum bars often to get, even to just invest into that, if you try and buy some on a crypto exchange. Whereas a lot of the, the newer, they're not really old coins anymore, but a lot of the newer currencies then don't have those same limitations. Mm. I've worked around that, so th yeah. they require proof of stake rather than proof of work, so that's uh, viewed as more environmentally friendly. So I, I, there's hmm. certainly validity so, in those comments. Yeah, so um, full disclosure, I do I do own some Bitcoin, a laughably small amount, it would be fair to say, um, but but I, I'm just sort of watching it in, in, uh, with interest. So the question is, um, how would the bank react if you turned up and said, look, I've got $100,000 of usable equity, I could borrow up to $100,000 on my house, I want to put it in Bitcoin or hmm. Ethereum or whatever. Um, the answer will is a, a bit, will vary depending on the bank um, and how you pitch the story. Mm. Uh, but what I would say is that um, largely the banks aren't allowed to make judgment calls on your investment. What they can do is say, if that investment goes to zero, can you afford the mortgage? So, um, you know, if you've got the kind of income that can um, and sustain, you, you have to assume zero returns um, from your, let's just call it Bitcoin for easy, mm. zero, zero percent return from Bitcoins, and it goes to zero dollars. Mm. And you still afford your mortgage, $100,000, yes, you can, um, then the odds are better that the bank will be happy about it. 
that. Now, a couple of things I would strongly um, suggest that you tell them the truth of why you are purchasing it. Um, don't tell them that you're doing renovations or buying a car. Just, just say, look, I, I'm wanting to invest, I'm wanting to use this money to invest in um, higher risk assets. Um, here is my income and I can afford a mortgage, you know, uh, over the amount of time that I've got left. So I've got 25 years left on your mortgage, then you can. Uh, and, and realistically, you know, even with the triple CFA, the banks should be able to, um, to give you that money. Mm, right. The question is um, uh, whether you would, and my basic formula for that would be that I am I am paying um, three and a half percent. Well, let's say let's say I'm paying five percent of my mortgage for the next couple of years. Um, would I expect more than a five percent return um, on that, whether whether you're staking it or whether it's a growth? Um, uh, and that's, <laughs> now I'm not going to say whether I think that is, but um, but mm. I'm sure anyone who's involved in cryptocurrency probably has a view on it. Mm. Um, and, and that that way, you know, if you borrow a hundred thousand, you pay five thousand dollars of interest, you're going to get whatever thousand out of it um, in returns. Is it worth it? Mm. Probably, yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's good. So it's so it's not, the bank. It's not that they're anti crypto, but you do have to be upfront. It sounds like. Well, we think it's always better to walk, work through your, your mortgage advisor, work through the mortgage lab, of course. Uh, interestingly enough, that's a good point. Okay, you borrow 100000 Let's say that you put it into a coin. Um, let's sort of pull up one here and see what they're looking like today. And you, and you staked it to get a return. Uh, so if we look at something like Tezos, that's about 5.66% return. Cardano is about f just under five. Solana is just under six. So you're uh, you're kind of either just under or just over break even point uh, on those. Yeah, things, you? At that, I'm, because I'm know. sure everyone that invests in crypto pays their taxes on it. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> after tax, you're getting about the same return as your um, mortgage interest rate. But you know, look, um, that doesn't allow for capital growth as well and things like that. Yeah. So I, I imagine at this point, if anyone's ever tried to start a business, they're probably yelling at the screen at the moment, but the bank didn't like my investment in a business. And and I do want to point out that the difference there is that by investing in cryptocurrency, you aren't cutting off your income source. So if I'm a salaried person and I want to buy a shop, then that income that I was borrowing is no longer guaranteed. It's now a shop. And that is the reason that the banks are a little um, grumpy about buying businesses mm. um, uh, leveraged against houses versus something that we're talking about where I still keep working day in and day out and then uh, cryptocurrency is an additional purchase. So that's, that's a little um, difference. Mm, okay, that's, that's good to know. So I guess whether it's to invest and manage funds, like for example, uh, chatting to uh, Miles Flower um, from Money Planners, he said, you know, in yep. Australia, it's quite a common thing, quite a part of your investment portfolio that you'll invest in property, you'll bo borrow funds to invest in manage funds. And I guess t looking over the last sort of 10 years, typically we would say, you know, 8 to 12% is what financial advisors tell us in terms of uh, returns that you're looking at. So it mm. kind of, the math stacked up. Okay, well, maybe I'm paying five, but I'm looking at probably around eight. So 3% or maybe a couple hundred thousand, that's a good return. Whereas in New Zealand, it hasn't been like, you know, you borrow to buy shares, you know, mm. Like seriously, you know, so there's a, a maybe a different uh, world for you. Tolerance, right? Yeah, yeah. Risk tolerance. Yeah. Uh, so I, that was very interesting to find out that that oh yeah, that's a thing. It's a very common thing just across the ditch. Yeah. So yeah. um, one thing to to compare it to, which is which is almost exactly the same thing, but but different. Uh, fascinated into a river. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so if you are paying your Kiwi Saver at um. Uh, 10%, say, um, you're a salaried person, you're paying a QS over 10%, and you are um, paying your mortgage at the minimum rate, you're fundamentally doing that, right? You you could have been paying down your mortgage, but instead you're leaving the borrowing there and putting it into managed funds. Now, you haven't actually physically applied that money back and put it into the QS, but you are channeling your money into the managed funds rather than paying down your mortgage. And look, there is... There's no right or wrong answer in this either. It's it's your view on future returns of the market versus future interest rates. But 
I think it, it potentially is more common than in that method mm. in New Zealand than grabbing a chunk of money and putting it. That's in, true. Right. So tons. you might not have gone and borrowed uh, to do that, but instead of paying off the mortgage, you're using the funds for some managed funds for some Kiwi Saver, and Kiwi Saver is managed funds by another name anyway. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Mm, okay, so good point. So it may well be that vast amounts of New Zealanders are, are in effect, already doing this strategy, but they just haven't thought of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to think so. I, I don't know how many people are overpaying their minimum payments on their QE saver, but mm. it would be nice if they were. Yeah. Um, look, even I mean, when we're recording at the moment, the, the share market has not been kind to people. Um, but over the long term, mm. which is how you should always look at um, the share market. It, it's been a good return, right? Mm, okay. So, and I guess really then it's going to come back to whether you go into shares or crypto or, or NFTs or all the above, etc. It's going to be a, a bit of a discussion between, you know, your risk advisor and your financial advisor and your lawyer will have some thoughts. Your mortgage advisor will talk to you about that and then you make that decision once you've had that input. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's it. Yeah. Mm. And I think as long as you are... Um, I think where the bank will start to get nervous is if you had a freehold property uh, and let's say it's worth a, a million dollars um, and you wanted to borrow $800,000 to put it into Bitcoin or a, or a new altcoin, I think that's where the, the bank's going to start coming because that is clearly a large percentage of your net worth in a high-risk product. Mm. Um, so yep. when I say the banks don't have the right to judge, there is a, there is a line that anyone can see is far too risky for a, for an average investor. Um, but, you know, if, if it's a small amount, if it's 5% of your net worth and a high-risk thing, then, yeah, I, I don't see the banks having a problem with it. Yeah, and, and interestingly enough, uh, just picking up on that 5% figure, I know chatting to uh, Daniel Carney, another financial advisor, a couple of months ago, he'd said maybe 3% of your total investments should be crypto. So for... Um, for many people, like if say if you've got a million dollar house, that's thirty grand. You know, it's not much out of out of the whole thing. So, yeah. uh, and so we sort of say to people, look, if you want to do that, just dip your toes in a little bit. Um, and there's a few do's and don'ts so that you don't buy crypto and you send it off into some wallet that, that doesn't exist, and then it's gone. So the way is, you know, get a little bit of familiarity with it before you you do a big pitch there for it. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, good to know. We really appreciate those insights because these, these two questions have been something that have been on the to-do list for some time. So it's nice to get those insights and, again, just to uh, demystify it for us. Um, the, the breaking the mortgage rate is a fascinating one because it's it's not easily answered, but is, and yet everyone's asking it. I yeah. Um, so. so final question, if... You, this you know property investor or a homeowner is looking at this video and going well those maths uh, you know you, you lost me at hello um, <laughs> hey, <Joe. laughs> do we, can they contact you know the the mortgage lab and say I don't know if I, I should break or not I, I can't work the math out you know and not feel like an idiot uh, but just you know a little bit of help there yeah and look absolutely that's what we do. Uh, all day, every day, really, and and no cost. You know, it's um. I think what you're not going to get from us is a crystal ball, solid guess um, of the interest rates. Mm. Um, we wouldn't like to put our money down with with your money fundamentally, um, on that. But we will talk you through the reasons why you know you might think it's going higher, or you know, why the economists think it's flat, or whatever, uh, and then talk to you about the decision you'd make based on that sounded reasonable. So, um, and we, it, <laughs> we'll do it a lot better than I've done it. So it'll be a lot calmer and, and typically of a video we'll do, um, we'll type it out. So you've got, you know, things to, to kind of see on the screen there. Mm. Um, but look, that doesn't cost anything. That's, uh, we get paid by the banks to do that. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It was cool. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Cause I think that takes a bit of the stress out of trying to figure that out. And obviously, we can't expect advisors to make our decisions for us. We've still got to bear the responsibility for that. But at least if we can educate ourselves, then we're going to make a better decision as a result.